I'm Emily Geddes. I'm Frank Hutchison. And I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley. And welcome to the Hidden History of Business. Today we're going to talk about Nana Asma'u. Now she is just an incredible woman that I just recently learned about. I did not know she existed before I started doing research for this podcast. But she revolutionized the way that women in particular were educated in early 1800s to mid-1800s uh, Africa in the Sokoto Caliphate, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But she was born in 1793 to a man named Usman uh, Dan Fodio. He was a very well-educated and highly respected religious teacher at the time. He was a prolific writer, and Usman Dan Fodio was Muslim, or he followed a particular sect of Islam called Sufism. It's a mystic dimension of Islam, very focused on having a personal relationship with God and very focused on education. He found ideals in Islam to create the perfect society. He saw Islam as the vehicle for eliminating oppression, for getting rid of corruption in politics and in leadership. He criticized leaders who neglected the rights of the poor, who heavily taxed their people, who threw up obstructions to business. He was very focused on helping his society create the freest society possible. He, so he encouraged education, he encouraged literacy, and particularly noteworthily in women. They, women and men were seen as very much equal in this sense, that everyone should be able to have access to an education. And so he followed through with this with his daughters in particular. Nana Asma'u's mother died when she was only about two, and so her father's other wives raised her, and one in particular named Hawa was kind of like a second mother to her. They lived in the city-state of Gobur until about 1802, when the ruler at the time, Yunfa, who used to be a student of her father, Usman Danfodio, got to be kind of nervous. He got afraid of the growing power and influence of Usman Danfodio and uh, exiled him. Af- well, he actually <laughs> attempted to assassinate him first and oh. then exiled him. Plan B, huh? Well, you know, if one doesn't work out, then the other one maybe hmm. Can. Usman Don Fodio had so many followers that this actually led to a war. And it, you can look it up on Wikipedia or wherever you want. It's called the Fulani War. It took from about 1804 to 1808, but it ended up with Usman Don Fodio taking over the kingdom that Yunfa was ruling over, and it led to the creation of the Sokoto Caliphate. And what area did that cover? Well, it was pretty incredible. It actually ended up at, at its height, covering 30 different emirates or kind of like individual city-states with their own little leaders that all fed into Sokoto and about 10 million people. Oh. And this was in the area of Nigeria mm-hmm. and the Sudan. Yes. Well, mostly Nigeria um, and Cameroon, more to the west. Mm-hmm. The Sudan's a little further to the east, and it didn't reach up quite that far. But yeah, Nigeria, modern-day Nigeria, Cameroon. Nana Asma'u really came of age as an intelligent and educated daughter of a very well-respected and powerful, influential person. So she had a lot of privileges that were maybe not accessible to everybody, but she received a classical Islamic education, which of course included memorizing the entire Quran, but also studying classical philosophical texts and uh, legal matters, and she had a very wide-ranging education. Basically, she spoke four languages. Arabic, of course, is the language of the Quran, so she spoke Arabic. She also spoke Fula, which was the native language of a nomadic people in West and Central Africa, the Fulani, that uh, were very much in the area. She also spoke Hausa, which is the native language in large areas of northern Nigeria and southern Niger. And uh, Tuareg is a Berber language from further north, like Morocco, kind of that area That as was well. the traitors. Right, exactly. So she spoke these four languages in large part because that's what the people in the area yeah. spoke. So like, um, a, like what we would call today a liberal arts education. She definitely had the breadth of all of those different areas. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. In 1807, so at the age of about 14, she got married to Usman Gigado. And she had her first of five sons in 1810 when she was 17 or thereabouts, which seems awfully young 
to us. And is awfully young, even it by is. the standards of the time. Absolutely. That doesn't seem to have prevented her from writing and continuing to educate herself. She was, like her father, an incredibly prolific writer. Now, we don't know a whole lot about specific details during this time in her early marriage and when she was having children, but we know that she wrote, it said, 61 pieces of poetry that are still extant. Mm-hmm. She wrote journals. She wrote letters. She debated with leading scholars of the day, both religious and non-religious. She taught both men and women. She advised her half-brother, Muhammad Bello, who became the caliph after her father, passed the leadership over to him in 1817. And he was the son of of her her second surrogate yes, mother, right? He was of uh, Hawa. So there was some closeness there, I think, from maybe growing up together under that same mother. One interesting thing is I notice as I was reading her history, it seemed like every time she gave birth to a son, she was writing a book. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. seem, and you think about it, she was obviously well to do. Mm-hmm. Well, she so wasn't she living poverty. She didn't have the daily tasks of having to, you know, find food for her family and create the food and everything else. So she definitely had the ability to sit and write. But she yes. also, she ran large households. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was a manager of some great skill because mm-hmm. she was running these well-off households with hundreds of servants. Mm-hmm. And it's the same type of thing you would see later on, for example, or at the same time in uh, England. You have the wives of these gentry and the uh, aristocrats who are running these estates, even though the husband would be running the lands, they'd be running the household. Very similar, yes. Um, but then in 1820, um, so this is shortly after her half brother kind of took over the day to day leadership of the caliphate, she was asked to facilitate the organization of all of her father's writings. And she was ideally suited for this role because he wrote in all four of those languages that she mm-hmm. spoke. In fact, he started writing when he was age 12, which is incredible. But so this was this was her first s- official state duty that she was given. I mean, th- this was a huge undertaking because her father was such a prolific writer. It really required a great deal of, of skill and patience and organization. She also needed to be able to keep in mind all of these different pieces that she'd read so that she could continue to categorize them correctly. It's been compared to as a task in scope of the compilation of the Quran after the Prophet Muhammad's death. I mean, it was a big deal. And some of these writings are still used today, some of the writings of her father. And this was not a task that was normally given to women at all in in the society. Traditionally, this had been done by male scholars. But she was so ideally suited to the task, Mm -hmm. both in her extensive knowledge of her father and his writings, and in her ability to read and speak in these languages, and her management and organizational skills. She was ideally suited for this task. And her ability to write. She was obviously very dedicated to education and to literacy. And in 1830, she developed really an incredible long-distance learning program for the Caliphate. A a way to allow everybody, really, to get educated, especially those who I think were most likely to be left out of most traditional education systems, like the poor and rural women Mm -hmm. in particular. So this was called Yantaru, and there is some evidence that some form of this system existed as early as the 16th century. But what Nana Asma'u did is she took it and made it systematic. She formalized it and organized it in such a way that it was incredibly effective and wide-reaching. And it sounds like uniform over a large area, as opposed to being sporadic in different Exactly. Regions. Well, over the entire Sokoto Caliphate, which was, you know... Ten million people. Large. I mean, it's about the size of, I was reading, the continent of Australia. It's a pretty big yeah. area there. The word Yantaro is Hausa, one of the languages she spoke, for those who have come together or the sisterhood. And the idea is that she would take girls up to about the age of 14, between 10 and 14 or so, and then women who were over 45, and she would bring them to her home in Sokoto. And there she would teach them in a lot of instances using her own writing, but she would teach them religious texts. She would teach them how to read and write. She would teach them all of these other pieces of knowledge and skills and and abilities that they didn't necessarily have in all the outlying areas of the Sokoto Caliphate. And then these girls and women would go back to their hometowns 
and they would become kind of itinerant teachers moving around and teaching people in their homes. It was primarily the older women who were the itinerant teachers. The younger ones would be educated, but when they got married, it was like, okay, they can't go out and roam the countryside teaching anymore because they have duties at home, and they will have young children, and they have to take care of them. But the important thing is that now they're educated so they can educate their children. And then once their children are old enough, about when they're 45, the women are 45, now they're sort of freed from their household duties. So now they're able to go back out and start teaching based on what they learned, plus their studies, plus their life experiences of being mothers. Now, these teachers were called jaji, again, another Hausa word, that refers to the leader of a caravan. So they kind of adopted this word that was normally used for men to mean the male leader of a caravan and applied it to these female teachers who would gather up these younger girls and take them into Sokoto or travel around to more poor or rural areas where... Uh, women weren't able to get out to travel to Sokoto and become educated. Which is a really smart branding tool when you recognize that there are, I mean, in a society where there are traditionally a lot of gender tensions, where women are disrespected, when the the, The government, um, yeah, but when they endorse a group of people using, when they say, we're going to use this word for them, Mm -hmm. that means a respected leader, someone with experience and skill, that's what you go with. And that definitely is a shift in how people had to view them. To go along with that, she would give each of these jaji teachers, respected teachers, a large malfa hat made of fine, silky grasses. Now, these hats were usually worn by men, and they were they're very distinctive, large balloon shapes because they're made to be worn over turbans. But it was very very distinctive. It was the the mark of an office. Mm -hmm. Chief, uh, you you didn't wear these unless you had some some standing in the society. So Asma'u deliberately took up this symbol and gave each jaji this malfa. It was this emblem of women's education and ability and respectability and leadership. What she's doing is it's like a personal blessing that she's giving them Mm -hmm. and giving them the authority of her to do the teaching by giving them the symbol. that With her own hands, she gave it to them and placed it upon their head so that they were personally approved by her. Well, and again, they were teaching mostly from her works. They would use her poems, her letters, her writings as... Some of them she wrote as mnemonic devices to help people remember Mm -hmm. things. Some were just simply used as lesson plans. And a lot of this was done um, orally by spoken Mm -hmm. word rather than by writing things down. The literacy was absolutely very important. But that also shows how well she understood the problems that women were dealing with that you might not have resources available. So you have to have tools that can be used both with paper and pen or whatever you had on hand, or that can be done orally. And obviously there must have still been a lot of, I mean, we don't want anyone to get the idea that because the her father emphasized that education was important, suddenly all gender issues were gone. Obviously the fact that she needed to use this name for the teacher, she needed to give them this mark of office, shows that she understood there were still barriers to be overcome, and she was using the language of the culture to try to overcome them. Well, and also the constraints of the culture. Women who were basically marriageable and childbearing age were not given those symbols. So she existed within the constraints that society placed on her, and she didn't try to say, okay, all women are now free, and they can burn their bras and do everything else. That never no. happened. You realize that women that's like not actually a thing that women did. <laughs> I'm just talking about it. But it sounds good. It makes it me sound good. Sound bite. Right. Right. Now, but there was right. also a system. Of, they, it wasn't just a, you know, one and done, meet with Asma'u and then you're free forever. The the Jajis continued to touch bases with her, relaying information from the women that they taught, bringing her problems that they had expressed that they couldn't solve, that the Jaji couldn't solve with the with the women that they were teaching. So it was also a wonderful method for her to really have uh, her fingers on the pulse of the entire kingdom, the entire empire, what was going on. But it was also a, a way that you know they could bring problems back to her. She could help them work through how to solve them and you know, inc- continually increasing the Jaji's skills as well mm-hmm. so that they could go back out and be more effective. And that means that these teachers were then acting as mentors because the teaching was not done in public. It was all done in the s- seclusion 
of the home. Well, I think it's really cool because as we, we discuss this training program, it sounds a lot like the training programs we teach people to use in quality management. Yes. The idea that if you just train someone and you send them out to train people and you never check in again, you're going to get that um, transference where each time they teach someone else, it changes just a little bit and a little bit more. This way they keep coming back. They keep getting trained from the source. She maintains that control over it. She's able to catch mistakes early. They're able to work through problems and create almost this co- cohort of teachers who feel connected somehow. And it's not just rote, but it's also being able to have intellectual tools to Mm -hmm. be able to think through problems and to be able to solve them, Mm -hmm. even when she's not there and she hasn't given the specific answer. Mm -hmm. It's that balance between, here, go off and be independent and do things and solve problems yourself, but also, we're here, you have support, we're all still connected to each other. Yes. And it was, again, a way for her to, to influence to the wide reaches of the entire empire. It really opened up educational opportunities to women and and people who had not had them before because her approach was so methodical and practical and adaptable to the situations of each of these individual women. And there are actually, I was really very pleased actually to see that there is still a Yantaro system in place today. There's you can actually go to yantaru.com and there is a pretty extensive network that still uses a method like this or very similar to this. Even in the United States, there are chapters of uh, Yantaru, the Yantaru Foundation in Pennsylvania, in California, in Florida, Massachusetts, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, where women are still learning from each other in this way. And it also happens internationally. There was an article that we found that talked about a a woman, a Jaji in Benin, over in Africa right now, who teaches uh, women via the internet internationally in the same way, where you can't necessarily get out to all of the people everywhere around the world, but you can make that connection through the internet and still pass on this wisdom. And I found it real interesting, too, that she kind of emphasized, like, for example, the young girls that were brought to her. What she would do is put her hands on their head, smooth out their hair, basically give them a blessing that they would find good husbands and raise children in the faith. So Yantaro is this international program. And one of the Jajis in California, her name is Najia Ali. She has this great quote that I love that I'm going to end with here. She said, women are the foundation of the Muslim community. They are the first educators. If you have ignorant women, you'll have an ignorant community. If you have knowledgeable women, you'll have a knowledgeable community. And that's really the philosophy behind Yantaru and behind Nana Asma'u's dedication to education in general, but specifically to women's education. Both she and her father really saw it as essential element of their Muslim faith to make sure that everybody had the opportunity to be educated because that would lend to a better, more ideal, less oppressive, and freer society. And it produced these professions for women that they wouldn't have been otherwise. It changed their teaching industry. And the amazing thing about it is that it still goes on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 200 years later. I'm going to close with this quote from that great article I mentioned earlier. Asma'u was by far the most prolific writer and influential woman to have emerged in the Western Sudan during the 19th century. Her keen intelligence and her intellectualism were linked to a marked determination to use her talents for the good of the population. She created the space for women to seek education and to be respected in their own right as learned Muslims. What is more, she extended her vision to include poor rural women with hardly any education at all and gave them instruction according to their ability to learn. If you like this episode, consider leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or social media. You can find snark, updates, and behind-the-scene peeks at production on Twitter. Our handle is at HiddenBiz. That's at Hidden B-I-Z. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business. Music for this podcast is from the album Time Within Itself by Michael Waldrop and used with permission of the artist. You can find out more about it on iTunes and Amazon. If you'd like to access show notes and multimedia content and the periodic rant from your hosts, be sure to visit our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com.